Well, the Armed Forces Minister, James Heapy, uh, is here. We've been wanting to talk to him about all sorts of things all morning, but I think you were listening in to that. Uh, heartbreaking, isn't it, for so many people like Andre, who are here, but loved ones are there, watching the scenes, watching the, the bombs rain down and the weapons go on. I mean, clearly, you want Putin to fail. Uh, that's the goal and to stop. But does failure in the short term necessarily mean he will? And how much more will he turn to tactics which deeply affect civilians? Well, good morning. That, I'm afraid, is the, the great sort of paradox in all of this, uh, that you know, Russia's plan in the first place was spectacularly hubristic, uh, and they have failed to achieve almost any of their... Uh, of the goals that they set themselves for the first 10 days of the conflict, and we're now beyond day 20. And that's testament to the heroism of the way the Ukrainians have fought to defend their country. But on the other side of this, and this is the bit that makes for all of these horrendous TV pictures, the Russian tactic, therefore, has been to besiege Ukrainian cities and launch artillery strikes indiscriminately. Um, Mariupol is the city, I think, that causes us the most concern uh, in that regard, but it's almost as bad in Kharkiv, Sumy, and a number of places besides. Um, and, you know, in a way that was simply not the case in Aleppo or Sarajevo or any of the other big sieges of the last 20, 30 years, the thing that's really concerning is the Russians aren't even showing any interest in allowing the International Red Cross or any other humanitarian organisation to get into those cities. It's just... It, it, it's, a, it's a despicable way to prosecute armed conflict. It's illegal. Uh, the, uh, there is uh, growing evidence of war crimes on, on a big scale. That evidence is all being gathered. Those people will be held to account. But if right now you're hiding in your cellar in Mariupol, mm. that doesn't count for much. You well, it's as we were just stop. hearing from Andrei Shevchenko. He has friends and family who have been underground for 22 days. Mm. Uh, his mother and his sister, he has managed to get to the west of the country. But we were talking to our correspondent a little bit earlier on, and Lviv, which has been considered one of the safer parts of the country, has been bombed overnight. Certainly feels like, and the information we're getting is that the Russians aren't making the progress, that they're coming to a standstill. Vladimir Putin is escalating things, mm. starting to bomb more indiscriminately, and that is a real concern for the Ukrainians on the ground, and it feels like there's not a lot we can do to stop it. Uh, so, uh, there's, a, there's a number of things there. Uh, so, uh, firstly, I think that it's the cities in the east and north of Ukraine where, um, where the artillery strikes are really indiscriminate and are causing uh, massive destruction and death of civilians, which is utterly abhorrent. I think what's happening in Western Ukraine clearly will be very concerning for the people who are in Western Ukraine because it's felt pretty safe until now. But it's not unsurprising that Russia is trying to go after uh, the supply lines um, that are allowing uh, um, weapons and, uh, and other military goods to enter Ukraine uh, from Poland. Um, that, however, is... I, so I don't think it's an escalation to see what we're seeing in the west of Ukraine. I think that is just targeting supply lines, which is to be expected, even if um, unfortunate for those who are, who are caught underneath. Um, what we need to do, however, is you know, continue to get those weapon systems to the Ukrainians so they can continue to resist as heroically as they are, as they are. continue to put pressure on Russia to accept that there needs to be humanitarian presence in some of these cities that are under siege. It is, you know, it is extraordinary that uh, in, in Aleppo, the ICRC were able to get in. In Mariupol, they're not. Um, that needs to change. And you know, you're right to, to Andrei Shevchenko's family who have been hiding underground for 22 days, absolutely terrified at the sort of carnage that is being unleashed above them. Um, this is not the life that they thought that they would be leading in 2022. Um, we'll continue to give the Ukrainians everything we can to defend themselves. But ultimately, this all sits with one man, and that's Putin. He needs to stop. Well, the people of the UK have been desperate to help and 100,000 of them have registered to open their doors and, and take refugees in, which goes live today, doesn't it, effectively? It's when the link-up start to begin. How do people get in touch? Because still it's quite challenging navigating your way through the system. You had to register earlier this week 
and then you have to have a name of someone that comes to you. Um, is the support going to be there for are the people? Are the government people putting, putting something together? It on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, people are the have government going to help make that connection? Because yeah. you've got to find the name of a refugee to bring to your home. What yeah. did the government do to help that? Well, it's exactly... I mean, I think there's, there's... After setting up the Homes for Ukraine scheme, which I think is a great thing and the response has been amazing, there's two ways of doing what comes next. Either government can act as a sort of centralised... Uh, point at which offers a match to refugees. But I'm not sure that that is the most efficient uh, and quickest way of connecting refugees to the people that have made these offers. I think that there's an amazing, uh, vast number of charities and NGOs who are engaged in this who will do it more quickly. And if I just reflect on my own constituency, you know, the Wells Coronavirus Network, who came together to support our community during the pandemic, have now sort of repurposed themselves to look at how they could be the focal point for bringing together offers around Wells to take in refugees. Um, and I actually think that's the right way of doing this. That's a more efficient way. And then government does the bits that government is good at, which is, you know, making sure that local authorities have got the money they need to okay. support the problem those families is, when they arrive. OK, but, but it's going to happen today, isn't it? And we've been comfortable about people yeah. to say, well, you need to have a name, and we don't know where to get a name. Not everybody is on Facebook or wants to, to find a person to come to their home in that way. So maybe it'd be helpful if on your website there's a list of charities, if you're saying that that's where you're looking to go to. Um, we've noticed that, you know, we've spoken to you many times since the awful situation started to escalate. James Cleverly has been on twice this week, Liz, Liz Truss almost weekly, uh, Ben Wallace as well, all key members in this, but not Pretty Patel. Is she embarrassed about the accusations of incompetence over the visa scheme? Why is she not seemingly front and centre? Well, I think that the fact that the Foreign Secretary, the Minister for Europe, the Defence Secretary and the Minister for the Armed Forces have been the most frequent contributors to, to your show is probably a reflection of the fact that this is an acute moment of foreign and defence policy challenge. It's also uh, an acute humanitarian crisis that our viewers have been really keen to get involved in and they come under the auspice of the Home Secretary. Well, no, the humanitarian relief in Ukraine, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania is very much a responsibility yeah. of the Foreign Office and Defence plays a key part in enabling that. I accept that there is a domestic policy issue over yeah. refugees and how to bring them here, yeah. but so too is that a responsibility of the, the Department for levelling up and communities and that's why we've heard from their Secretary of State as well. I certainly don't think that the Home Office are in any way conspicuous in their absence. I think it's entirely right that at a moment of great geopolitical challenge and security threat, it's foreign and defence ministers that are no. to the fore answering your questions because people are fearing for their security. Here. Yeah. Uh, one of the other major news stories that we'd like to get your thoughts on, of course, is the news that a lot of P&O staff members had yesterday where 800 were laid off as they went into work and were on a ferry. Outrage everywhere, outrage from a lot of politicians. It doesn't really mean anything, does it, unfortunately, for those p &O staff members who have no sense of recourse with this? Uh, I mean, I I'm sure that the government are looking at this. Is there some sense that p &O have broken the law here and that these workers can be protected? Well, look, first of all, you are absolutely right that the fact that I am sat here talking about how despicable it is, how wrong it is, how unfair it is, uh, will be no consolation to the person eating their breakfast who has yesterday lost their job. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not right for me to be saying it. I think it is important that the government shows that it is cross about this. And my colleague, Rob Quartz, the Transport Minister, was in the House of Commons yesterday and he was seething at the way that all of mm. this had been The done. problem is, though, is we that there to, was well, a bill... Question, and if Kate, I could sorry. interrupt, uh, before you come on to that, there was a bill, wasn't there, that was looking at and changing and reforming and trying to get rid of the yeah, higher and fire. The employment trading yeah. union And you voted rights. against it. Yes, I did, uh, and actually so did most members of the... In fact, virtually every member of the government. Um, the reality is, is that whilst... The Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy have been absolutely clear that the practice of fire and heart is clearly wrong. That bill, which was a piece of backbench business, had a scope to it that we think would have been damaging to 
business generally, and it wasn't the right way to do this. But what was discussed, if people go back to the uh, excellent debates that were had about this bill in the House of Commons, is ministers were very clear that this is a practice that we need to address. It just wasn't the right piece of legislation so in the way that it was done. So is being looked at bench. now, Mr Heapy, because there are uh, devastated members of P&O staff who have lost their yeah. jobs, and the idea that people, agency staff, can get hired on far cheaper wage because the minimum wage doesn't work when you're on international waters is just brutal for them this morning to see that. Yeah, look, 100%. And, and as I said, you, the, this is all stuff that is on the record. If you go back to what the government said in those debates, absolutely nobody had any argument that the practice of fire and, uh, and rehire was, was wrong and needed to be addressed. It is being addressed. The issue was that that bill itself, Sorry, I don't it think, is was being the right addressed. How is it, it being addressed, just briefly? Because that might be well, some comfort. How is it being addressed? Well, I mean, firstly, I don't think it will be any comfort to the people who have lost their job this morning. No, no, They're but worried how is about it where they get their next paycheck from. How is it them. actually being addressed? Well, the government, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy is looking at how we bring forward uh, a, a better uh, regulation or laws or whatever the solution might be to address this. And actually, I think, you know, as we go into a period of, uh, of inflation and wage pressures, clearly there's going to be um, lots more dispute between employers and employees. And it's right mm. that this is a good moment for government to be looking at this, but let's not pretend it's any consolation whatsoever to the people who were sat no. in their homes this morning having lost their jobs because P&O have behaved appallingly. OK, good we're going to have to leave it there. James Heavey, thanks for joining us.